All right, then what we're going to do today, we're going to do another um, sort of lavish lecture first, where we're going to talk about um, more spectra. So the IR spectra, we spent some time on in lab last, last week, and then you had that homework assignment um, where you got some practice. IR is one of those ones where um, both the, the logic behind it and once you get used to it, the way that you interpret those spectra is not something that you really lose. It's like riding a bike. I was talking to Brad Peden in the library, one of the tutors, um, about it because he took this class probably two or three years ago now. Um, and I'm like, oh, they might be coming in with some IR questions. Like, IR can handle this, you know, like, when you get the hang of IR, it's really straightforward as long as you have that table of frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. NMR is tricky. NMR has way more data and everything is significant, which means you have to be paying a lot more attention. It's not as quick to interpret and there's a lot more room for misinterpreting things. As long as in IR, as long as you understand that, okay, I think that I'm looking at this, but I guess I could be wrong. As long as you understand there's some inherent uncertainty with some of those frequencies, there's not a whole lot of places that you can, the, the danger in IR comes from overestimating your certainty with it. As long as you understand that there's still some uncertainty in the things that you're seeing, um, it's not too bad. Again, NMR, you got to pay a lot more attention, but we'll go through the theory for it a little bit first. Um, because again, this is the same, same technology and the same physical phenomena that lead to MRI machines. In fact, an MRI machine more, uh, more accurately should be called an NMR machine. Um, but the N in NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. And when they first put this all together and how to make an MRI machine, it was during the Cold War in, in the 50s and 60s and the word nuclear was scary. Um, so they just dropped nuclear and called it magnetic resonance imaging instead of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, um, just to make people feel more comfortable about it, um, which is kind of funny. But it also does now means we can avoid confusion because MRI is the medical side and NMR is the chemistry side. Um, but basically, has anybody worked at, at all or had an MRI done before? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's basically just one giant. Big magnet, one right? Big magnet that just spins around. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were watching. Um, my my son is ten, and so he's getting into like bad action movies. We've been watching some of the '90s James Bond movies, and there's one of the the one with Halle Berry has a, an MRI machine where he like throws something from across the room, hits the button to activate it, and it sucks all like <laughs> everything. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's really all it is. And the chemical version of an MRI machine is the same thing, except that you will change your orientation um, because you basically just have a tiny tube that you put in the middle and you don't need to accommodate an entire body. You have a sample in a very, very thin quartz tube, um, like a really skinny test tube, except made with the hot, really high-end quartz so that you know what the crystal structure is like more accurately. Um, and you put it in this magnet, and what, basically what you get is if you have a nucleus that has non-integer spin, which we don't usually talk in chemistry, we don't really talk about spin as it applies to protons and neutrons. Uh, we just talk about spin as it applies to electrons, but it turns out um, protons and neutrons have non-integer spin as well. And that means that anytime you've got a nucleus with an odd number of nucleons, meaning protons plus neutrons, you get a nucleus with a non-integer spin, where your spin is plus one half or minus one half. Well, if you have non-integer spin, that actually means that you have every nucleus has a tiny magnetic field associated with it. With electrons, especially in organic chemistry, all of our electrons are paired up, right? So we don't have a, we have an integer value for spin on the electrons because everything is paired up. You have zero spin if you add everything up. Um, so the only magnetic field on the molecules is in the nuclei themselves. 
And so if you put them in a strong enough magnet, what will happen is you wind up with these nuclei that have these this non-integer spin will align their internal magnetic field with the big giant electromagnetic field you just made from the electromagnet. And it happens with weaker magnets too. It's just a very, the magnetic field on these nuclei is really, really small. And so you need a giant magnet to cause a big enough interaction to get them to line up. But basically what happens when you when you do this is you wind up with them all, you put a big enough um, field on it. You can think about these two different, the two different ways you can align their spin, like being two different energy levels, like we would see for, um, for electrons. And if you put a big external magnetic field, there's going to be a low energy state and a high energy state. Your low energy state is when they're paired up, or, or your, um, your spin is matching, your magnetic field or your nuclei is matching the magnet's magnetic field. So everything's pointed the same way. But if you can have it lined up so that they're pointing the same way, you could also have it lined up so that they're exactly opposite, right? And so that gives us these two different energy levels that when, when everything's pointed the same direction, we call that the alpha spin state. And then the higher energy state is the beta spin state. So we take, we take this sample, we put it in, in the presence of a very strong magnetic field, everything lines up and by default, everything's gonna line up into the alpha spin state. because that's a lower energy spin state. If we shine light of varying frequencies on that alpha spin state, we can actually get them to switch from the alpha spin state to the beta spin state. So similar to IR in that regard, right? And this is why it's a form of spectroscopy, why it's still considered measuring light, is because we're shining the light on it to get it to transfer between these spin states. And then when it falls back down in energy, it's going to give off light of the same frequency, right? So that's all NMR really is, is it's looking at what is the energy gap between the alpha spin state and the beta spin state. And every unique nucleus that with a non-integer spin, with an odd number of nucleons, is going to have its own distinct signal because every unique nucleus has a unique magnetic field because the electrons around it are slightly different. So every distinct nucleus is going to get its own signal because every distinct nucleus has its own distinct energy gap. And that's all NMR is, is looking at these energy states and, and applying them to how that the electrons must be arranged in order to do that. Um, and so we can see this with, we do this with any, like I said, any non-integer spin. So any odd number of nucleons will give you, you'll be able to take an NMR of it. The most common ones are proton NMR because hydrogens, not, or most hydrogens only have a single proton, right? So a hydrogen nucleus has non-integer spin and then carbon-13 NMR. Carbon-13, so carbon-12, we can't do much with, right? Because carbon-12 has an even number of nucleons, which means it has an integer value for the spin. Um, but carbon-13 occurs naturally about 1% of carbons or carbon-13, which means that 1% of the carbons in your sample will actually show up on an NMR as well. But basically, all the different types of nuclei that you can look at are going to have their own distinct set of wavelengths that you're looking at. So basically, we can ignore the carbon NMR and just look at the proton NMR as long as we're looking at the right frequencies. The carbon NMR is still happening. This, the same stuff is still happening, but we're just not going to measure the, those frequencies when we're looking at proton NMR. And we change some settings on our NMR machine and then we're, now we're not, now we're going to ignore the proton NMR and just look at the carbon NMR. We'll, we won't get to carbon NMR and do much with it until next quarter. Um, because believe it or not, this is week 10 of 12, which means we're getting close to the end here. Um, and then uh, um, there are, but there are other more 
esoteric might be the right word for it, types of NMR. If you're in a group that studies fluorine, fluorinated compounds, fluorine's got an odd number of nuclei because fluorine is, is 19 protons plus neutrons on its most common isotope, right? So you can have fluorine NMR, you can have, and then you can start getting more complicated with it when you do things like have two-dimensional NMR, where you measure um, the protons on one axis and the and the uh, carbons on the x-axis. And then where they interact, that tells you certain different things. So there's lots of ways we can look at, use the same technology and then get more creative with it. But we're gonna start with proton NMR because that lays the, the groundwork for everything else. And it's the most common. Are we gonna do this with our sample we made last week? Or are we just- No, so you, you know how much how expensive an MRI is, right? Mm -hmm. MRI machine. So we don't have an NMR machine here. I will give you the NMR spectrum. <laughs> I will give you the spectrum as though you took it yourself, just like we did with the IR, if that's what you meant. But um, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, yeah, it'd be really nice, but can we really justify at this school spending 50 grand on, a, on an NMR that we're going to use, you know? A school with 700 full-time students. And yeah, we're going to use a farm machine. Yeah, so we're, we won't do that. Um, but just, we, will, we will practice using or uh, interpreting them. And then every, because every department that you would transfer into, if they have an NMR, they're going to have their own set of procedures and their own, like every NMR brand has its own computer program that goes along with it. So you, that's, you know, proprietary. And so you would wind up having to learn their procedures when you transfer anyway. So you're not missing out on that much. It's basically you take your sample and you put it into that little test tube and then you, you give it like a collar made out of Teflon that basically... And then the magnetic field and uh, some air flowing through a, a narrow tube keeps it suspended. And then it can spin really, really fast in there. Um, and so, but basically all you do is you make your sample, put it in the tube, wipe it down, put it in the, the larger tube, and then make sure that it's spinning evenly. And then you click a button. So, um, like I said, you're not missing out on that much. But CNC. Yeah, I'm sure. It's spinning properly, quick, but exactly. <laughs> Every different CNC machine is going to have its own procedure and program that goes with it, anyway. So, um, so here's naturally what things would look like with no magnetic field. All of these these non-integer spins are just going to be randomly oriented, right? Just based on kinetic energy in a strong enough magnetic field, they're all going to naturally align themselves, either be alpha pointing with the applied mag magnetic field or beta pointing 180 degrees from it. Do, they have the, do the individual magnetic fields have an effect on each other? So this is all one giant, they're drawn as separate arrows, but this is all one magnetic right. field. The, the black ones. Oh, oh, do they have an effect on each they other? They do. Okay. And that's actually, we get, and we can interpret that. We actually get signals within signals when we look at the magnetic fields. And so a proton on a molecule, a hydrogen on a molecule, is gonna interfere with the hydrogens on the adjacent carbons. And that actually causes what we call peak splitting, where we get a signal that's a collection of smaller peaks. And that's actually something we can interpret, but it takes a little bit of practice. Um, but here's the actual process. So here's our magnetic field does all. You turn the magnetic field on, everything aligns into that alpha spin state. Then we turn on radio transmitter, which basically is just, these are really low energy transitions. So we're using radio waves, so really low energy light. Um, and so we, we broadcast, if you want to use that term, we shine radio waves on it. Um, and that's going to flip some of them from the alpha state to the beta state, which we represent with these yellow. It's a higher energy state, right? And then we turn the radio transmitter off and we wait for those for them to flip back to the alpha state. And when we do that, different frequencies it'll and give off exactly. Yeah. It'll be the same frequency given off, right? It's the same frequency as that delta E between the alpha and beta. We shine all the different radio waves that we can on it to mm -hmm. inundate it to get everything into the beta state. And then when they flip back the other way, the light that it gives off gets measured. Gotcha. Right. And then 
once we once all of the re-emission of the radio waves has happened, once everything's flipped back to being the alpha state, we can turn off the magnetic field and everything's back to normal. Right, so basically the MRI that you get in the medical field is just computer processing of the same information. Um, that's why it's really good at measuring some things. Like if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, the MRI is pretty good at measuring where water is in your body. Um, it's, less, it's not as good at measuring things like bone density because bone is all calcium phosphate and calcium and phosphate are all nuclei that have an even number of nucleons, right? So you don't use an MRI or to measure bones because there's nothing in a bone that'll actually show up on an MRI. Water does, carbons do. So it's, that's why MRI are so good for soft tissue is because that's where all your water and your uh, other things are. And if you've ever had any, um, there are a lot of different ways you can use some of those uh, nucleotide tests, those radioactive nucleotide tests where the, you'll drink a small radioactive sample and then they'll track it through your body. But a lot of those, they pick the isotope really carefully so that it's an odd number of nucleons so that you can use an MRI to track where that is. So if you give the right isotope of iodine, you can see the way that it filters from the digestive system to the thyroid, for instance. Um, and so lots of those different isotope tests are gonna use something really similar to an MRI, if not an MRI itself. But it's gonna be tuned to a different type of of element, um, depending on what you're trying to study. So they find like which blood vessels occluded and yeah, is exactly. Active. You give a radioactive. Sometimes it's just they're just tracking the radioactivity, but sometimes it's the specific isotope that they can do, um, where you can do NMR with that. Um, you can also do things like um, you can enrich glucose so that it's got so that all the carbons in the glucose are carbon thirteen. And so you'll see carbon-13 showing up in higher concentrations with the first places that the glucose goes in the body. So you can track the, di the metabolism as well by doing things like this and then watching the MRI for specifically for carbon-13s, where do you get a spike in the body? Um, and that's also how they did a lot, of, how they first did a lot of the um, biochemical pathways they would take a yeast cell and they would feed the yeast cell glucose that was all carbon 13s or all deuteriums or something like that. And then they would see what other molecules in the yeast cell showed up having elevated levels of carbon 13 or elevated levels of deuterium. Like, okay, so that means the glucose was broken down and then turned into this. Um, so they, they call that um, radioisotope, a radioisotope study. There's a lot of different terms for it, but that tech, that basic technique, um, and then do something like this as your way of tracking it, um, if you picked your isotope as well. All right, so what do we actually see when we look at these? This is a sample of a proton NMR, which again is going to be the most common form, the one that we're going to start interpreting. Um, and it works one for one. We also notice that they, they do the reverse numbers on the X axis. Again, I don't, again, I have no idea why we count down, um, or count from right to left in these spectra, but we do, um, typically double check that because that one's not as set in stone as IR. Sometimes you see them the other direction, but the main thing that you're looking for, just like with the IR is what are these numbers? Where do the signals show up? So that's the, the main, so there's a couple of pieces of information here. Most basic of which is because I, I told you that every unique proton is gonna have its own signal. The number of signals is the number of unique protons you're gonna have with one caveat. And that's that aromatic hydrogens, hydrogens on a benzene ring, all tend to lump together. Their signals just wind up getting overlapped on top of each other, but they do always show up in the same area between six and a half and seven and a half. So I don't know how many aromatic hydrogens that, are, that is right there, but I know that they're aromatic hydrogens. So the peaks in those clusters, each one is a unique proton? Not necessarily. So if I'm looking at this, I don't know, like I was just saying, I don't 
know how many aromatic hydrogens there are, but I know that this is a benzene ring that has a bunch that has more than one hydrogen attached to it. But these ones, you see that the, the shape of these peaks within peaks are kind of vaguely bell curve shaped. This is one signal. Oh, okay, that's what I was wondering. So, and it, you know, you can, you can kind of visualize, okay, they, they should look like a bell curve for the most, for the most part. There's a, they're gonna be a little bit skewed here and there because of other things that can happen. But that's one of the ways you know that this is all one signal even though there's four peaks within that signal is because one, they're really close together and two, they're vaguely Gaussian distribution. All right, and the same thing here, this one's skewed a little bit to one side, but these three peaks are all on top of each other. This is one signal. So out of this, I know I've got a benzene ring and then I've got two other distinct, chemically distinct protons. When I say chemically distinct, that means like if I have a methyl group, all three of those hydrogens are identical to each other. Because you can't tell the difference between them, so they will all show up as the same signal. So then the number of peaks within one signal, does that then tell you how many unique protons are close to the one? Almost, yes. How many unique protons are close to the other one? Um, and so they call that, that's the, the splitting. The splitting of each signal tells you, it basically has to do with the way those magnetic fields interact with the nearby hydrogens and that the, you, the identical protons can't interfere with each other, but they can interfere with the carbons or the hydrogens on nearby. So the number of peaks that you get, and we'll do, I think I have a whole slide on this in a second, but I'll say it since you asked the question. The number of peaks that you get is the number of adjacent hydrogens plus one. If you have one adjacent hydrogen, that adjacent hydrogen can have a matching spin or it can have opposite spin. So there's two ways it can be arranged. So one adjacent hydrogen shows up as two peaks. Three adjacent hydrogens means there's actually four distinct ways they can be arranged. So there'd be four peaks. So there'd be four peaks. So this one right here has four peaks in it, which means there's three adjacent hydrogens. You didn't look like you liked that, Christelle. No, oh, I did. I was like, oh, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so basically, if we have CH2, those two hydrogens can't interfere with each other. But if it's next to a CH3, those two hydrogens can be interacting with the three hydrogens next door. So what that tells us, if you had a peak with four, that means either you've got a CH2 and a CH on both sides, or you've got a methyl group on one side, because a methyl group, those three adjacent hydrogens, will give you four peaks in your signal. Okay. What causes the different, like, magnitude? Would we call well, it electronegativity? Okay, all right, so what? what do you oh, mean? you mean like the, the Gaussian distribution? Just how big it is. The... Yeah, so there are, okay. so the, the, the amplitude um, is, does not tie directly to anything, but the integral of the signal does. Gotcha. The integral of the signal, the area under each signal is proportional to the number of protons in that signal. So the number of peaks tells you about the, the neighbors, but the size of the signal, specifically the integral of the signal, tells you how many is there. Right, and again, so... And that wouldn't necessarily be how many molecules you're looking at. You gotta throw some more math at it to figure out what... Usually, basically, you, you usually would integrate all of these peaks at the same time and know that you've got an integer number of hydrogens in each peak, right? So if you, if you integrate this one and then compare it to this one and you see that this one is 0.66 the size, uh, of the size of this one, or that this is 1.5 times the size of that peak, you can say, okay, well, that's probably a two to three ratio because I can't have half of a proton. And so you just pick your smallest peak and then compare everything else to that. I'm pretty sure I'm, I know what this 
what this is. You would normally want more information to be able to do this, but I've done this not enough times and I've made the slides. <laughs> um, so if I'm looking at this, if I went through, and usually you don't have to do it the way we do with the GC, where we go through and integrate from a from an Excel file. Most of the programs that will generate these will actually integrate for you. You just basically click, click here and click there, and it'll integrate that area. And it'll, it shows up as a signal that looks like that. And the, the vertical height is the integral there. So if I'm looking at this one, and then basically when you do that, if you have three signals and we look at that, we would look at this and say, okay, well, that's my smallest integral. So I'm going to call that one. And then it just automatically ranks the rest of them relative to that. So if I call this one, it might give me this is 1.5 and this is 2.5. We know we can't actually have 1.5 and 2.5. So what do we actually have for the number of protons there? Two, three, and five. Double everything, right? right? And it's not always that clean. There, are, there is noise that happens in there sometimes, but it should be close to an integer value or a fraction, a clean fraction. Sometimes you'll get it, you know, like a third in there or something like that. But usually you're dealing with things that the big, the most common way that they don't match up exactly is if your smallest signal is a two. You can have it so that your smallest signal is three, in which case it's not going to be as quite as clean. But it's going to be the same general logic for it all the way. I know that each of these signals has to have an integral that corresponds to an integer number of hydrogens. So if it's not an integer number, you can always just times it by whatever n right. number to exactly start with two and see if that makes everything clean. If it doesn't, okay. multiply by three and see if that makes everything clean. All right, so you guys have already asked most of the questions that are on the, the following slides. But so the number of signals is how many unique protons we have. Where each signal shows up, what they call the, is called the chemical shift, is just where on the x axis it is. And then the units on it are weird, they're units of parts per million, but they're related to the frequency of that light that comes off. For whatever reason, the actual process of measuring, we don't get something nice and clean in terms of units like megahertz. There's probably a conversion where we could go parts per million into megahertz or kilohertz or something like that. That's just not the way that they're usually reported, though. So it's basically just related to frequency. It's related just the same way that wave numbers was for IR, right? Because of the, the history behind developing all these different techniques, they all have their own unique units. It doesn't really matter. Just know that it's tied to frequency and don't worry about it too much past that. Because um, the other factor in this is basically how much interference is there between the electrons around the nuclei. More electron density is going to be closer to zero on the chemical shift. More, um, less electron density is going to be further to the left. So they call that downfield, or they call it deshielded, because when you pull electrons away from the nuclei, there's less interfering with the signal, and it's going to show up more to the left. Right. So we would look at this and say this peak is the most deshielded, has the the least electron density around the protons, and just like with IR everything, all the different functional groups are going to tend to show up in distinct places. Like I said, that's how I knew this was the aromatic one. I knew that these were benzene, the benzene ring or something aromatic with hydrogens attached to it, because benzene ring hydrogens always show up between six and a half and seven and a half. And you uh, kind of deduce it because benzene, like in terms of electron densities, all the electron density is on in those pi bonds, it's right? Pi bonds, yeah. Which means those hydrogens that stick off to the side are less shielded. And you can get things like, like um, carboxylic acids. Those hydrogens by carboxylic acids are really deshielded because those oxygens are pulling all the electron density. So 
So like aldehyde hydrogens and carboxylic acid hydrogens show up like double digits. And then all of your alkyl groups, this is where NMR separates itself from IR, is because your alkyl groups all show up in here and they're still distinct enough you can tell them apart. As opposed to IR, where you could just say, okay, well, that's sp3 hydrogens and those are sp2 hydrogens, and that was all we could do. We can actually look at this and say, okay, well, that is the only thing that shows up around one is methyl groups, which corresponds with an integral of three. So this is a CH3. And what shows up between two and three are CH2s and our secondary carbons and tertiary carbons. So, but with the integral being two, we can tell that this is probably a CH2. And we know that this is a benzene ring with an integral of five which means it's a benzene ring with how many other things attached to it. So how do you get an integral of five on a benzene ring? Well, you have five hydrogens and then your R group attached. Oh, so you have, okay. Oh, that makes sense. So actually this is, when you know how to read these, this gives you pretty much everything you need to be able to pick between the isomers that you drew from your IR. You use your IR and say, okay, I know I've got these functional groups and I know this is the formula, but I can't really, all I can do is come up with possibilities. And then you use the NMR to decide between those possibilities. And in some cases, you get more information from the IR. Like this would not have shown up with as much of anything on IR because we don't have any oxygens. We don't have any nitrogens. We don't have any, no oxygens means no alcohols, no carbonyls. All we have is carbon hydrogen bonds really, right? So this wouldn't show up as being anything we could really get much information from an IR other than proving we don't have oxygens. This then is everything we need though to get the rest of the information. So what is the final structure for this molecule? It just has to have all of these different things in it. It's got to have a benzene ring with one R group. It's got to have a CH2 and it's got to have a CH3. Well, CH2 would be connected to right to the benzene and then CH3 would be yeah, right off the left. <laughs> Boom, there is a cake. So, so like, I, like I said at the beginning, there's a ton more information in NMR than in IR, but keeping track of all four of these things at the same time takes some practice. And you don't have to use all of them necessarily. If you get something where, um, like the, the peak splitting, that can be tricky sometimes because there are certain things that throw that off. Like having an oxygen, like the, the proton that's attached to an oxygen and an alcohol, the oxygen actually disrupts its, its splitting. So you can't, actually can't trust the splitting for a hydrogen that's attached to an oxygen. But you can always trust the integration. And you can always trust where the chemical shift it is. And usually you can trust the, the how many signals you find, with the exception of. We don't really know that. We can trust the integration more than we can trust number of signals when they start overlapping like that. And with that, is it just kind of because there's you know different hydrogens in the benzene ring that are right. at a distance from the ethyl group, so there's just different layers of interaction there? Exactly. So this, this hydrogen here is next to two identical hydrogens, so it should, it should be three peaks on top of each other. Yeah. But it's showing up in the same place as this one, which is next to two that are identical, that are not identical to each other. So their signal is going to be a little bit more muddled and not symmetric. The reason that these that this one is not as symmetric has to do with the benzene ring pulling one side versus the other. And so you put all of that on top of each other, and you get a big mess. Where you might not be able to look at this and tell how many signals that is, but when we integrate it, that should answer the question. Usually, sometimes they show up really cleanly. Sometime in that benzene ring area, you'll get something that looks like this, 
that usually course that whole thing will correspond to two signals that are interacting with each other. So you get basically splitting within splitting. So sometimes you can tell things like that, but you can't always trust it with, when it comes to the splitting. The splitting is probably the, the, the least trustworthy part. So if your splitting doesn't make sense, but everything else does, then you probably have the right structure. Sometimes you can use the splitting to finalize, to be like the final nail in the coffin. Like I am 100% sure because not only does everything else make sense, my splitting makes sense too. That's the holy grail. That's what you want, right? Something like this, where we could look at that and say, okay, this, and you can usually trust the splitting in this area. It's when you get oxygens involved, when you get the aromatics involved, that's when the splitting gets too, too tricky to read. Um, and that is actually probably something that AI might change because AI is really good at doing things like taking that and splitting it up into discrete signals. Um, basically removing, doing a Fourier transform, which in a Fourier transform is basically taking waves that are overlapping on top of each other and splitting them into separate waves. Um, and AI is pretty good at doing stuff like that. So that is one place where that might change. You might not actually have to worry about splitting as much because NMR is predictable enough that you fed it to, a, to an AI that was trained on, on these things. It could probably do a better job than most humans could pretty quickly. Um, so all of this, but again, just like with anything else, we still need to know the basics of it so that we know when the AI is falling apart. If AI gives you an answer that's clearly wrong, then, you know, because you could spot check it basically. Would this also be sort of muddled because of sterics? Sterics don't matter quite as much as the, as the electron density. So if you, you can wind up with things shifting, if we did something like put a, a fluorine on there, Fluorine is not going to show up on our NMR because we're just looking at protons, but it can shift the electron density so that these, so that the shielding is different. It's going to de-shield everything that's close to it, which might make your methyl group shift this way a little bit. Um, if you had it attached to the benzene ring, it might shift this whole ring over half a unit or something like that. Something like a T butyl group do that too, where it's just bulky and kind of pushing on other electron clouds. It's not going to really, not as much as you would think. Okay. That the sterics will inter interact with each other and keep it locked into certain conformations, gotcha. but they're not going to really affect the electron clouds that much. Okay. Um, in general, the more hydro, the more carbons you have around, I guess I can't really generalized too much with that. So stay tuned. There, <laughs> we have more information coming that'll, that'll end, in, answer some of that. Um, so each of the following sli um, slides is basically just explaining the various terms we've already kind of talked about. So more de-shielded, sometimes you see the word downfield. Um, I'm not sure why, again, but Upfield closer to zero is more shielded, all mean the same thing. Um, usually we actually, we can set zero to be whatever we want. We, we actually have a um, particular molecule, a particular solvent that we use um, that we just call zero for this. It's tetramethylsilane um, or TMS. So it's a silicon with four methyl groups attached to it. So that has only one, one unique proton there, right? So all of these hydrogens will show up as the same um, signal. And because the silicon is right there and carbon is more electronegative than the silicon, they have high, they are more shielded than almost anything you'll actually see in an organic molecule. So we just said, okay, well, this is the most shielded that you could get protons, we'll call that zero. And so we also tend to use that as the solvent because it's a liquid at room temperature, it dissolves organic molecules pretty well. So that gives us something over here that I chopped off to make room for this. But basically you'll have a solvent peak at zero. Then that corresponds to tetramethylsilane, TMS. 
I mean, if you're using like a different solvent, maybe like uh, GCM, it would show up probably somewhere else. Exactly. So dichloromethane has hydrogens in it, and those hydrogens are going to show up at a very specific known spot, though. And same with acetone. We rinse stuff with acetone a lot, and then look, wait for the acetone to dry up. Um, but that the acetone protons are going to show up in their own distinct spot. But again, luckily, acetone and, and dichloromethane are both really commonly used solvents. So if you get some, in, the other thing is that trace solvents left over from the purification process are not going to integrate cleanly with our other hydrogens because the concentrations are different, right? So basically, you'll get like a little bit of noise at a very specific spot. You know, you get something right there, but it doesn't match up with the integration. Because and if you try to make spot, that like, a, like an actual integer with the rest of the ranks, that's not, it, you can't do that. Exactly. Yeah. Nothing's going to make sense. And so it becomes pretty obvious to see when you've got a solvent noise. Um, and they do, and again, they, they will always show up at the same spot. And actually, the other nice thing about acetone is that acetone only has one distinct um, proton as well, right? Because CH3 and CH3, those show up as the same signal because they're chemically identical, they're symmetrical. So, and there's no adjacent hydrogens. So you'll get one peak, very clean, and it usually smaller than the rest and always at the same exact spot. And then so you even see this in papers that are published in, in synthetic chemistry, where they're just like, that's the solvent peak. It just means it's leftover acetone. Yeah. Um, and we're just going to ignore it. Um, and you can see how also that if you had a table of frequencies, this would be the chemical shift would be pretty easy to interpret as well, right? And they do have like the most obvious one are the aromatics because they are way far away from everything else. And they're always in very specific area. The more alkyl groups you have, the more you're going to have signals over here that might start overlapping with each other and they're harder to tell which one's which. But that's where the splitting and the integration come into play as well. Um, so this is the, the table from um, the compound interest, that uh, chemistry site that I use all the time. But basically, so an alcohol hydroxyl, the OH, the hydrogen on an alcohol, can show up anywhere in here, and same with amines. So oxygens and nitrogens make this more tricky to interpret, trickier, trickier is a word. Um, but you'll also see like, okay, a primary alkyl shows up here and secondary alkyl is really close to it. And a tertiary alkyl is right there as well. Um, and then you've got some, if you have, are in the allylic position where they're a little bit further to the left, but they're still down and around that same region. If you look at the numbers there, right? So you wind up with most of your peaks, most of your, your carbon hydrogen bonds um, are gonna show up in the same general area. And that's when they can be tricky to interpret these. But that's why you see anything in that, that six to eight range, especially if it looks like a big mess where you can't tell distinct um, hydrogens, it's almost always going to be aromatic. Um, carboxylic acids and aldehydes are all the way down here. Amides, we don't aren't going to deal too much with amides when it comes to NMR because amides show up really cleanly in IR. So a lot of times we can use the IR to decide, oh, I definitely have an amide. Um, but again, none of these are ever going to be in a vacuum. You're always going to have, like, especially if you're going to the trouble of taking an NMR of something, again, it's not that much trouble. You put your sample into a test tube with some TMS and get it in the, in the magnet. Um, but it's, it's more trouble and more cleanup than taking an IR of something. So if you're going to the trouble of taking an NMR, you're probably also taking an IR. And so if you have an IR and an NMR, and you know the molecular formula for the same substance, usually that's enough pieces of information that you can at least get really close or narrow it down to it's one of these two and I can't decide, but here's my best guess. Right, and so this is, this taking these spectra and interpreting them and figuring out what a substance is, is its own, it's called qualitative analysis. Qualitative analysis is always meaning 
We're not, we don't care about measuring yields or we don't care about how much of it we have. We're just trying to determine what it is. Um, and that was one of my favorite classes. I took a fourth year class in, in undergrad on, that was just qualitative analysis, organic qualitative analysis. In the midterm and the final, we're both, here's a white powder, it's organic. What is it? <laughs> and so you start by doing a melting point. You do some solubility tests. Does it dissolve in water? Does it dissolve in hexane? Take an IR of it, take an NMR of it. Between all of that information, that's usually enough to give you a pretty good idea of what you have. And then your final grade was, you got it right on the first try, you got 100%. If you got it right on the second try, you got a 90% and so on. Um, so we just had like a week of, here's the instruments, here's your unknown, get back to me. And then you had to do a write-up on it, of course, but like the bulk of it was just, here's what it is. And then our textbook had a, had about 80 pages of compounds at the back. Um, and it was just like, okay, it's, it's on that list. So and, uh, <laughs> like get out your magnifying glass, like level of print. I'll, I'll bring my textbook to lab. I think I have that one in my office. Um, and, like, and then it was like, okay, well, if this is what it is, if I'm down to this, I'm gonna take that. And there was basically, you could confirm it by putting it through a, a chemical reaction and then taking the melting point of the product. So if your melting point was close to the, the literature melting point, and then you put it through another reaction to get what's called the derivative of it. And the derivative also had the same melting point as you were expecting. And you had the IR and the NMR, that was usually enough to be like, okay, I am fairly certain. If you try to make the derivative and you get something that's way off, like, okay, back to the drawing board, it's not that one. That didn't work. Um, but anyway, it's, it's like doing a crossword puzzle, right? You're using the information from one spectrum to inform the other spectrum and go back and forth. When you get the across clues, but you're missing one of the up and down ones, you use the information from the across clues is enough to get there, right? It's the same general thing where we're taking these, this multidimensional puzzle, taking all these different pieces of it and trying to make something that makes sense. All right, let's, let's take a quick break. Let's come back at five after, and we'll do some more practice with this. That sounds like a really fun test, honestly. <laughs> It, it was a lot of fun. It was stressful. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, just because it's like, I've done all the work. I'm pretty sure I know what this is, but there's still that moment that we can submit. And, you know, um, but, uh, and there's a lot of compounds that have similar properties. And so it's like, I narrowed it down to one of these two. I've got a 50 50 shot. So I'm going to get 100 or I'm going to get a 90. Right. Um, but uh, it was, I had, a, I had a lot of fun with that class, um, especially since it was at the end of four years. Okay. So I, like in OCHEM, we introduced these ideas yeah. and then kept adding on the more classes I took, the more like, okay, well, here's this other way to do NMR. Here's this other type of test you can do. Gotcha. Um, so we, it was, it was a capstone class and those are always kind of fun because you get to use a little bit of everything. And tool belts very well stocked. Right? Exactly, awesome. exactly. Yeah. How was your weekend? Good. Well, I do this. Oh, I was studying mostly this weekend, learning uh, Hebrew too. For, oh, okay. Yeah, because my my buddy's gonna gonna be taking a biblical Aramaic class, and so I'm like, I'll just take it with you. Like, it's the same alphabet. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, it's just, I didn't actually know that. That makes sense. So kind of. So when you go back and there's like five like uh, temporal classifications of Aramaic. So there's like the early Aramaic, the imperial middles and something else. Um, but it, it kind of like Hebrew too evolved. So there was like a mm -hmm. proto-Hebrew, which was very like much more pictographic. Like mm -hmm. the, the first letter Aleph was just um, a really like simple sketch of a bull's head mm -hmm. horns. And so like, uh, it's interesting because it's like a totally different way of thinking. Like English is very, uh, abstract in a lot of ways, like you know, words like 
love or anger or something like that. They're not, you can't really, there's no sensory yeah, associations with that, whereas Hebrew is very, like, very like sensual in that sense of, like, it's, like, the bull represents, like, strength, leadership, mm -hmm. um, and it's also the same, uh, the same character also means poetry, because it's, like, a very strong tree, and so it's just, like, a totally just a different way of thinking, which is really yeah. cool. Um, like, a lot of Hebrew, there's much of that, when you look at the old Stuff. Like like early kanji and stuff from from the Far East too, or hieroglyphics even for that matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that that pictographic quality to they, that. Yeah, like the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, they have an I, and that was one of the things. And then the the letter I also started off as an I, as an I I, right? I, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's, it's really interesting. There's a lot to it, and then like the different um, like there's like two different T's, but one of them. Uh, pet almost never gets used at the end of the word just because of like its meaning is always like mm -hmm. in the beginning or in the middle. So you can kind of start figuring out the meanings of words based off of the individual letters and how they interact. Yeah. So like like there's a really simple word dog d g is fish mm -hmm. and then do is fishing and the u sound is made by a, the letter vav which is like a hook so mm -hmm. that goes right in the middle of the fish. <laughs> so it's just like little things like that that make it easier. And that's actually where that came from, or is that a coincidence? That's uh, something that you think that's where that came from. It's probably is based on like how everything else, but it's you know with when stuff's that old, it's hard right. to know for sure. There's there's still like debate between what the original forms of letters were and like how they evolved. Like there's still a lot of gray area there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. In in a lot of ways, we know less about early early Hebrew than we do about like. Like the Phoenicians and cuneiform, because of yeah. the because writing on on papyrus and paper and even on leather, like it doesn't last the same way that the you know the Phoenicians, the Assyrians that that wrote stuff on clay. Yeah, we have a lot of, of cuneiform stuff from that's way older than old than ancient Hebrew, but because it was written on clay and clay lasts longer, doesn't rot. Yeah, um, we know a lot more about. Some of those other other cultures in the same area, um, despite the fact that Hebrew is still a living language. It's funny, right? It's yeah. Funny. But and it's 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 like reading the really old stuff is is I mean there's a, it just takes so long because there's no punctuation, there's no spaces between words, there's no like diacritical marks indicating what vowels are there. Mm -hmm. So it's like you just it's all context clues. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. And there's a lot of like built-in ambiguity, which sometimes that has meaning. Right. So it's it's really yeah. It's, it's really sometimes ambiguity, ambiguity was intentional, and sometimes it was implied that you knew what was going on because yeah. you were in that culture. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, a lot a lot lost. So like you know, and trying to translate them like that into English, mm -hmm. it's really really hard to do because you have all of that going on, and then that different the different way of thinking. So like. Um, the Hebrew for uh, anger. So like, like you know, like the, the phrase slow to anger, mm -hmm. right? In Hebrew would be slow to the nose. Because the nose, you flare your nose when you're angry. And it's very like, there's there's not the idioms are very different, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's even like, we have nouns and verbs. Mm -hmm. That's like not really a thing in, in Hebrew as much. It's like the nouns are verbs. It's a very like active language. Huh. And so there's that like component. So like the nose isn't just nose, but it's like what the nose does. So it's about right. clarity of the nose. So that's why that means anger. But so you can't translate that in English as slow to nose, because that's not gonna make any sense. Right. <laughs> right. You have to know some of the idioms, or it just doesn't you yeah. have something that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah it's slow to smell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's ancient literary analysis is really, really fascinating too. Even stuff that's more recent, if you look at like the, the British Isles and, mm -hmm. and France, um, they, if you grew up in, in the West, a lot of times we grew up with the story of King Arthur, right? It yeah. turns out that there's not one story of King Arthur. Right. There's like 17 different versions of the King Arthur story. Right. It was, it was like Jesus. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but like, like the knights that were involved in the Grail quest changed depending on what era you were reading. Like Percival didn't take, or Galahad didn't exist until later, um, until Lancelot became part of the story. But Lancelot was a French edition. Yeah. 
So Lancelot didn't show up until later. So before that, before Lancelot and Galahad, it was Percival that went on the Grail quest and things like that. And so you like a lot of it, even like things that we like if it was a historical event, we would think the oh well, the people involved that didn't change. No, even even if you you put in like like there's there's a lot of knowing the culture and how the cultures interacted with the surrounding cultures um, is really key to understanding what they were actually trying to say. And that's before you get into things like the, um, the native cultures to Britain and the British Isles, um, the Druidic cultures and religions, it was actually, I think it was in Ireland, where it was against the rules of the religion to write anything down. They had writing, yeah. but they weren't allowed religious in a religious sense they weren't allowed to write down their own stories everything that was religious had to be passed down verbally and then you get the christians coming in there and say well saint patrick was was really a saint from our history when really saint patrick was was somebody from the celtic culture who was actually probably a king who came in and conquered some things yeah. but then they co-opted some of the existing folklore and the the Jewish culture was famous for doing that too. Every culture does it too, where they bring in the local gods that they, as part of the, the stories. So it's, I really like literature, literary analysis of really old stuff. I think is fascinating oh, because yes. you get into like so many Wikipedia rabbit holes. Like, wait, 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 what was that sentence there? That's a whole nother like branch of this whole argument that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> It's kind of like uh, I are at a bar and trying to put all the different puzzles together. Right, exactly. <laughs> now, just when you think you've got it under control, we're going to add it in very right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. melting point's not right again. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right, so this, this one is mainly in here as a way to show, um, this is another way of doing those integrals that you will see sometimes different programs will write the integrals this way where they'll just automate the red line is the integral. So when you go from left to right, we're basically looking at the difference in height. So, okay, for, so for this whole section, this height is the integral. So you're just gonna compare that height. And sometimes if you have this printed, you actually get out a ruler um, and just look at, and literally just measure the height difference between these two and compare it to here. And here, and here. You can just do it with a ruler, it just doesn't matter the number, it just matters the relationship. It's proportional to the number of hydrogens. The actual integral doesn't matter. The integral only matters as it's compared to everything else. So if, I, if I'm looking at this, I would look at this and say, okay, well, that's my smallest integral. So even though there's this is this big mess of a signal, that's our smallest integral. So that's probably a single proton. And this one, that could be one signal or that could be two signals. So, but and if I put the line right there, that's pretty looks pretty cleanly like it's two protons, right? So whether it's one signal or two signal, I do I can say if this is one, that's two. And then the question is, okay, well, is this three or is that two? Eyeballing it, that's a little bit difficult to say, but I'd say, I'd say it looks about 50% bigger than that one. So if I'm estimating, that's either two or three protons. But I'm looking at it, I'd say that that's probably three. And then over here, this looks back, back to being two again. And again, once again, I'm not sure if that's one signal or two signals, but either way, it looks like the integral is two. And then over here, down in the benzene re region, we have something that looks like a mess again. Looks about the same size as that three though, right? So assigning the integrals can be that kind of like, if you're doing it without a ruler especially, um, when you're not having the computer assign the numbers for you. A lot of times for, for you guys, when I give you a um, NMR, it'll either have them written like this, and then you just have to get out a ruler, or I'll have already assigned the numbers 
So it'll be say a one, 1 1.5, three, whatever. Um, right, but this is, <laughs> and you can see too, if we're careful, pay attention to the numbers down here, this one is at three right there. And it's cut off everything to the right just because there's no signals to the right. And so you have to check your, your table of values. But basically, we've been looking at this. Okay, well, that's three, and it's a single peak. That's probably a CH3 group next to something that has no nearest neighbors. A benzene ring that has three protons on it means it's a benzene ring where you've got three hydrogens and then three other things on it. We can't necessarily say where all three of those are relative to each other, but we know we've got a benzene ring that's going to look something like where we can't say for sure where those three are. In fact, in their problem, sometimes you'll see this as a way to say that R1 and R2 and R3 can be three different things. They could be the same thing. They could all three be methyls, but they're not necessarily the same. So rather, if you just use R as your placeholder, it's easy. To, well, is that R the same as that the other R? So sometimes we'll just throw in a subscript on them to say what which R we're talking about. Probably not because it does show up as integrating. It's a little bit of solvent. Either the solvent peak is going to be way bigger integral than everything else, or way smaller than everything else. But it's not going to be proportional when it comes to the integral. So probably not solvent. We would want to go back to this and say, okay, well, that one is between 5.5 and 6. Well, it can show up between 5.5 and 6. Yeah, it could be an OH group attached to there. That would explain why the, why the um, I remember how I told you that oxygens mess with the peak splitting. That could explain why the peak splitting was so messy. And we do think we have an, a benzene ring with stuff attached to it. So it could be one of these R's, could be an OH. That would explain this one. And then this is also a case where I'll try to give you better resolutions uh, as much of these as I can. It's actually surprisingly hard to find really good resolutions of these that you can blow up. Um, but like, I can't really interpret the splitting there, but I would say this is probably two different signals. Because that one looks like it's roughly bell curve, and so does that one. And their, peak, their splitting is not the same. If it's the same signal, it should be close to symmetrical as far as the number of peaks, at least. So this is probably one, or the same, close to the same splitting, but two different protons. So you got one proton that's going to have, I don't know, maybe two nearest neighbors and one that's got a little bit more. It's hard to read that. So let's ignore the splitting on that. But really, I, this, the reason for this is I'm just going through the process of interpreting this for the practice. Um, but you're never going to get this in a vacuum without more information, right? So not, you know, having the formula would go a long way to figuring out what the heck this was, right? Because that'll tell us, you know, how many carbons do we have? It's going to tell us if that's one signal or two. Um, but mainly, I just wanted to show you this is the other way of, of putting integrals on the page. Is sometimes you just see it like that. Well, the like three point eight peak probably be the solvent peak because it's like just like acetone or something where it's a very simple molecule and so there's no splitting. It's just the Methyl attached to probably not because it because again the integral is close to the same okay. the integral gotcha. makes sense with the others. Gotcha. Usually, if it's solvent, it's going to be either just be a tiny peak or it's going to way blow everything else out of proportion. Oh, because if there was like a methyl group on the benzene ring, it would still look like that because it's would be symmetrically interacting exactly. with it. Exactly. So this could just be a meth. One of our R groups could be a methyl group. One of our R groups could be an OH, mm -hmm. and then. This could be this could be several like an isopropyl group maybe um, probably not an isopropyl group because that would mess we don't have anything that has six integral of six but like it could be just a complicated branch attached there.
Right, so some other terms, I've been trying to not use these terms talking about the peak splitting because we hadn't defined them yet. Um, it's surprisingly hard. But basically, you, you talk about peak splitting um, by describing how many peaks there are. So if it's just a single peak by itself, we call it a singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet, sextet, anything past that word, it's too much splitting for us to really see what's going on. Uh, you can, in theory, have something up to like a dectet. If you had, you had, um, This molecule, there's only two distinct protons there, right? But this proton has nine nearest neighbors, which means it would show up as a, as a dectet. But once you start getting those, like we saw before, that you wind up with them not being able to see, they're just kind of all overlapping each other. Actually counting those out would be tricky. Um, so you would need, to be able to see with the, our zoomed in version. And I will also do that sometimes. I'll give you like, here's the, the whole picture. And then I'll, just like on a map where you have like a detailed inset of, you know, Central America uh, overlaid onto the larger map um, so that you can see the detail in the smaller countries. We do that sometimes with, with some of these as well. Real quick on that. Yeah. Um, why would the number of peaks be linearly proportional to the number of neighbors rather than like two to the n if there's because we're looking at different combinations of spins like up down versus above that so down, down. because a lot of them won't wind up being the same uh, the number of distinct the height is going to be the number of possible ways you can arrange that energy level yeah, sure. but the number of distinct energy levels okay. is based on how many hydrogens there are that makes sense and that's why it resembles a gaussian distribution because if you look at at two nearest neighbors, all three of them can be facing the same way. That's one energy level. All three of them can be facing the opposite direction. That's the other energy level. The ones in the middle are where you can have one, one up and one down. Gotcha. So that, that three peaks is representing four different possibilities. Correct. Okay. Okay. That that clears it up. Maybe. And if you had your stats, you remember like two choose or uh, eight choose one or something like that. There's like those different yeah. number of combinations, Pascal's triangle. Um, this actually follows Pascal's triangle, which if you haven't had as much math, Pascal's triangle is the one where you add the two numbers above it. And if you plot, any row of this, and you plot these heights, you wind up with something that's going to approach a Gaussian distribution. This is actually literally what we're saying. When you have two distinct things you can look at nearby, they can be arranged <laughs> they can be arranged in three different ways, two of them that are energetically identical. If you have three nearest neighbors, there's four ways they can be arranged. But these one, there's three different ways you can have them arranged. This or four different energies, but a total of six, total of eight different combinations, but six of them are one of these two. Right. And so then, and so that's why we have the same general shape doublet. If you only have one nearest neighbor, you can either be aligned or you can be not aligned. There's only two combinations. But then as you add more nearest neighbors, you get that more different level, number of energy levels. Um, and Pascal's triangle extended out to n equals infinity is the Gaussian distribution. If you have a true statistically significant number of, of uh, uh, in your sample, it's always going to look like that Gaussian distribution because that's the logical or that's the limit of that series of Pascal's triangle. If you take it down to the row of n equals infinity, you're going to get something that's um, bell curve shaped. 
Oh, there you go. I didn't even need to do it myself. <laughs> so your your triplets always going to be in that one to two to one ratio. The quartet's always going to be one three three one, one four six four zero, oh, one five ten ten five one. You can see how that extends downward, right? But again, for OCHEM, for actually taking these, we're not actually going to go. When we get past six peaks in a signal, they start getting too, too difficult to read and too much subject to a little bit of noise in there can really throw off your interpretation. So unless it's really, really clean, don't trust the peak splitting too much. All right, so in the number of peaks in those signals, they call that the multiplicity. So basically how many peaks should show up. So first off, for this molecule, how many, how many signals should we see for this molecule? How many distinct protons are there? Five. So you've got three protons there. And that's chemically identical to the three that are there, right? There's one hydrogen there that's different than anything else. And no hydrogens on this tertiary or a quaternary carbon, right? So, which means it won't show up as a signal. That's the other thing to remember with these is the only, only, we kind of talk about it in terms of the carbons that have the hydrogens attached, but a carbon that doesn't have any hydrogens won't show up on your NMR. It'll show up on a carbon NMR, but it won't show up on a proton NMR because we're specifically looking at hydrogens. So, that one and that one are not going to show up on your NMR. So for the red hydrogens, what will the multiplicity be? How many nearest neighbors and then add one to it? How many nearest neighbors are there for the red ones? There's just the one nearest neighbor, so it should be a doublet. And it should be a doublet with an integral of six, right? Because there's six of them with only one nearest neighbor. But thinking about it in those two dimensions at the same time is really helpful for me to avoid confusing myself. Remember the integral is still here too. Um, what's the multiplicity gonna be on the blue one in the integral? No, no. Opposite. All of these count, right? Because they're both the same. Because they're both the same. So this blue one, and even if they're not the same, they're still nearest neighbors. So there's six nearest neighbors on the top. Or sorry, three nearest neighbors on the top, three nearest neighbors there. So we should see a heptet. We should see seven peaks, the multiplicity of seven mm -hmm. on that blue one with an integral of one. So these ones are almost backwards which you see that a lot because of symmetry, right? Very few nearest neighbors, but with a really big integral. Lots of nearest neighbors, very small integral. How about purple? How many nearest neighbors? One. Plus two. One carbon that has two hydrogens. So that we should see this show, the purple one should show up as a triplet with an integral of two, but yellow. Also a triplet with an integral of two, right? So this is why these, these things, both of these are gonna show up in close to the same area too. They're both, they're both secondary carbons with two hydrogens. The one that's a little bit closer to the carbonyl will probably be a little bit more deshielded but you're gonna wind up with the purple and the yellow are gonna be real close to each other and with similar integrals and with similar peak splitting. So finalizing which peak goes with which carbon or with which protons 
can be a little bit tricky. And sometimes you'll have to take an educated guess. Last but not least, what's the multiplicity going to be for the green ones? How many nearest neighbors do they have? Zero. So there's only, if there's no nearest neighbors, there's only one way for those, those spins to be aligned, which means you should see just a single peak, no splitting. So we'll see a singlet with an integral of nine. And so one of the ways that I like to ask questions about this on a closed book test is one on both, I will still give you the chemical shifts to expect. Um, and I'll do something. Um, one of the pieces on your final will be, here's an IR and an NMR, and here's five possible structures. Which one, which of these structures make the most sense? So it does require you to do some interpretation, but it's also multiple choice. So it's not just like I'm giving you a blank piece of paper because that's hard on the times test. Um, the other way that I ask about this is like, here's a molecule, draw the NMR spectrum. <laughs> so like, and so that you'll get some more practice with that. But again, if you have a table of relative things and I'm just looking for qualitatively, right? So, you know, don't worry, just, you know, okay, this should be just like we just did. The red and the green should be the most shielded because methyls show up closest to zero. So I should have a doublet with an integral of six and a singlet with an integral of nine over on the right hand side. Then I'm going to have these two CH2 groups, both with an integral of two and both with a multiplicity of three. Then I'm going to have this big septet with an integral of one. Right. And so just putting them in the right order predicting the integral and the multiplicity and how many signals you should have. So the multiplicity determines the amount of... The multiplicity is the number of peaks. That's a synonym. The, the number of peaks that show up in your signal is what I mean by multiplicity. So, and sometimes that you can just put a number too. You don't have to write a singlet. If you write a multiplicity of one, that is a singlet, means the same thing. All right. So as we're, this one of the training wheels ways to ask these questions, here's the structure of this molecule, and here's the NMR. Which peak goes with which hydrogens? So we only have one. Well, so we have two methyl groups. Which of the methyl groups would be furthest to the right? Which one's going to be the most shielded in terms of electron density? The red or the blue? Could we, could we use the multiplicity to answer this? Because the red ones have one nearest neighbor, so we should see a doublet. Yeah. The blue, they're both going to be these first two, but which one's which? We can use the multiplicity to sort of split the hairs there. And because the blue has two nearest neighbors, so it should be a triplet. And we would expect, since it's furthest away from the chlorine, it should also be more shielded, the blue. Yeah. So if the out of these two, we do see a triplet. And it's further to the right, which means it's more shielded. Meaning less meaning electron. Meaning more electron sourcing. So closer to the more to the electronegative pieces, closest to the electron withdrawing groups are going to be further to the left. We can think of shielding as basically just how much electron density is around the exact nucleus. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And that's why it does shift a little bit, why everything is arranged, because if I threw a carbonyl on there, that's going to shift, even though there's still methyls, it still show up in the same region as a methyl, but they're going to be a little bit further to the left if I put something really strongly electron drawing, like an oxygen in there. So, 
our first peak. And then we can be pretty sure that our other methyl, so these also have similar integrals too, right? So we can be pretty sure this one is going to be our red signal, our red protons. Now, without looking at the splitting or even the integral, we have two hydrogen, two sets of protons left. Which one would we expect to be further to the left? The one with the chlorine on it. The one that's right next to the chlorine should be more deshielded. And how many nearest neighbors does it have? It's got five nearest neighbors, so it should be a sextet. And it should have the smallest integral because there's only one of them. So all of these pieces play nice with each other and we can use all of these variables when one of them's not being cooperative like spin, use the remaining variables to make sense of it. So yeah, and if we do come over here in this nice zoomed in one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is a sextet. So call that C. And when you get to your last one, usually it should just be a matter of making sure that there's nothing contradictory about it, right? We see four nearest neighbors. So we should see a pentet, quintet, quintet with an integral, with an integral of two. And one, two, three, four, five, that looks roughly double or integral over there for C. So, there we go. Right, and so see how much easier it is when you've got a proposed structure to try and assign them. This is why one of the pieces of the IR portion is draw some possible structures. Because if you have a list, even if you drew 10 possible structures, it's really easy to use the NMR to say, well, it can't be these five right off the bat because they don't meet my NMR criteria. And then, so then using it as a way to do process of elimination is a lot easier than just drawing the structure wholesale. Drawing it up from scratch takes a lot more finesse and, and you know, experience before you're going to be able to do that. But just switch the order of things, draw your, your isomers, your potential isomers first, and then come to your NMR. And when you get something like, well, like, there's no way that this could be right because three of these signals just don't match up with anything I drew. That just means it's not that isomer. Go to the next isomer. Right? The whole point of a big chunk of the scientific method is testing things and proving them false, right? We talked about falsifiability in here. It's not about proving things true best we can do is say it's consistent with the evidence. So that means going through and removing things that aren't consistent with the evidence is actually easier a lot of the time. If, if we have a properly designed experiment or properly designed um, information, if I give you the right information, set it up so that you can do that. Prove what it can't be. All right, this is what we started with. So we already did this one. But again, without the formula, that's going to be kind of tricky. It could be, we could be wrong on that one that I gave you before, especially since this doesn't have the integrals drawn. Um, it could be some sort of weird symmetrical molecule where we have twice as many methanes as we thought, right? We came, we looked at this and we said, ah, it's probably ethyl benzene. But in theory, it could be diethyl benzene without having the integrals and knowing that this is two and a half to one. It could be four to two, right? As far as the integrals go. So we can get a possible structure from this, but without knowing something like the formula and having the integrals drawn, it's, it's a little bit hard to say for certain what it is. All right, so let's do some IR practice. 
Um, so what are the four primary things to look for when we're doing IOP? Stuff around 3,000. Stuff around 3,000. Deduce if it's like SP3 or SP2. SP3 versus SP2. So without the numbers sitting in front of you, higher energy, that SP2 hydrogens, those are a stiffer spring. Um, and so SP2 hydrogens are above 3,000. So higher energy. So we don't have anything above 3,000. So, but we can be pretty certain, okay, these are SP3 carbon hydrogen bonds. We don't see any SP2 carbon hydrogen bonds. Doesn't mean there's no SP2 carbons, just no SP2 carbon hydrogens. And then what are the other two pieces? SP2 versus SP3, and then there was... What else is there in the IR? OH bonds. The OH groups, they show up as those big broad groups down here, right? If it's carboxylic acid, it can actually wind up being like that. We don't see either of those, so no OHs. Then what's the last piece? Any carbons that would Carbonyls. Carbonyls, yeah. They all show up around between 1600 and 1750 or so. There's a little bit of range where you can, if you're really good at this and you really trust your data and you know what you're doing, you can say, okay, well, that looks more like an ester carbonyl than a uh, amide carbonyl, for instance, but that's kind of splitting hairs. What we can say is that there's a carbonyl of some sort. And we have a formula, C6H12O2. That's enough right there to give us an idea of what we're looking at, right? But there's a lot of possible isomers we can still draw that fit that criteria, right? And so no OHs, but the number of, the other key piece to these is that the formula, um, looking at how, how unsaturated the formula is can be really helpful too. Is that limits what you can have. If you have 12 hydrogens to six carbons, we have at most one pi bond. Right? Or a ring. We can't have a ring and a pi bond, and we can't have more than one pi bond. So that right there starts limiting what functional groups we could be looking at, right? So no OHs, only one carbonyl, no rings. We start limiting ourselves a lot there, right? Then if we bring in the NMR of the same compound, we should be able to figure out what it is. So we're pretty sure that our one pi bond has to be between a carbon and an oxygen because we have a carbonyl peak, right? And no sp2 carbon hydrogens. So what sort of functional groups could we be looking at? You know, we've got the, this piece in there, no oxygen hydrogens, which means we must have something like this. So either an ether or an ester, because the only other oxygen bonds, the only other oxygen functional groups all have OHs or more pi bonds, right? So one, two, three, four, five, Distinct signals here. Does that match with what we have up there already? Is that any sort of contradiction there? We total of six carbons, but five signals. What does that tell us? The two of them are going to be the same. Or one of our carbons doesn't have hydrogen. Uh, oh, yeah. Which yeah. matches up here, right? Because it means that we, it's not an aldehyde at least, because that would, an aldehyde hydrogen would show up in a very specific spot. If one of these was a hydrogen, we'd have an aldehyde peak in the IR, which is kind of get a little bit hard to see, but we definitely show up. Remember, the aldehyde showed up down around 10 in the NMR. We don't see that. So it means we've got something like this, maybe put together as an ester, maybe two separate pieces. 
But let's see if we can come up with some options here. We're supposed to, weather's not supposed to start till Friday, I thought. Weather's always happening. It's true. <laughs> the storm. We're supposed to get an atmospheric river this weekend. Does everybody hear that? It's going to be wet. Um, but the snow doesn't start till Saturday morning, I think. I think we're just supposed to have rain Thursday, Friday. But, and maybe today, based on the cloud cover. Um, all right, so what could we have? If we put these two together, let's say it's an ester, just for simplicity's sake. It could be a, a ketone and an ether. But esters are fairly common. So if we're working with this, we have five other carbons we can arrange. What's What are some structures? Try and draw some before we start going through here. Get yourself down to some um, to a reasonable number of possibilities, and then we'll see what we can uh, eliminate. So these ones down around one. Here's, this is the other approach to just straight up drawing isomers is you can start saying, okay, this fragment looks like a methyl. This fragment or this signal looks like a methyl. And then start piecing those fragments together as well. And so depending on, on the exact case and your personality and the way you think, sometimes it's easier to draw all the possibilities and rule them out. Sometimes it's easier to start here. If it seems like there's way too many possibilities, start getting the pieces individually. These both look like methyls because of where they are in terms of shielding. And because of their integral, the integrals are the, roughly the same and bigger than the others. This one looks like that might be two. Right, and then this one looks the same, about the same integral. And these, this one looks to be about the same integral. And then three and then three. Does that give us a total of 12? So if our integration adds up to the right number of hydrogens, we can't look at any, none of these look like they're <clears throat> smaller than any of these, right? So if we say that these three are the same, if we said one, one, and one, how are we gonna to get to a total of 12? Right, so we know we have to have a total of 12 hydrogens. So sometimes working backwards from that can help with the integration as well. Sometimes the integration is really easy because you've got one peak where the integration is noticeably less than everything else. And it's really easy to say that must be one and go from there. In this case, everything looks a little bit closer to the same size. So assuming that the rest of the carbons then are, if we've got two methyls, the rest of the carbons all have integrals of two. So we've got three CH2 groups. And let me, color code them as well. Did I use red? I didn't. 
So how do we decide how they're arranged? Well, we're now we're to the point, okay, I've got three CH2s and two methyls. How could we arrange that around an ester group? Well, we could have R1 be CH2, CH3, and R2 could be CH2, CH2, CH3. We could have them reversed, or we could have four carbons on one side and one carbon on the other side, right? So now that gets us to the point where we can look at, at a, a smaller number. We're down to only four isomers that we can eliminate, right? Assuming that it's an ester. If none of our esters wind up making sense, then we have to go back to the idea of maybe it's a ketone and an ether separately. But let's see if we can make sense of it this way first. Um, or we can do CH3, and then this one could be CH2 three times into CH3. Which also branching. So good question. What would that do to our number, our signals here? Yeah, so it would change the, the amount of... It would change the amount of methyls. Yeah. If they, and if they were identical methyls, it would mean that one of our methyls would have an integration of six. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that we only have two signals down here and they're the same size means that we're not going to have any branch. But yeah. So that means that they're separated, basically. They, yeah, basically, you have one, you're going to have one CH3 on one end here, and let's see other CH3s on the other end, which means no branches, no other metals. So we could have that's C6, it's going to be H12, right? We could have the extra carbon on this side. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have just one carbon on the right hand side and four on the left. Or we got one on the left hand side and four on the right. So now how do we distinguish between all those options? How close those carbon groups are to the electron drawing region. Yeah, basically, we're going to look at how close they are. And we'll go back to that table. And I'm not sure if, the, if that graphical table that I threw up here had all of the detail. Um, Yeah, so there's a more there's a more detailed table of these. It'll say like, okay, if you want the alpha carbon to a carbonyl in an ester, it's in this region. And if you're the alpha carbon on the other side of a, of a ester, it's this region. So they, they have some that are noticeably more detailed than what we have here. At this point though, I mean, just getting it down to four is a pretty good job. But this is assumptions with uh, the shielding. We're making some assumptions with the shielding. And then we do splitting. Um, well, and actually, the splitting actually tells us that this can't really be, um, we can't really have an ether and a ketone right. because. There's only so many ways you can separate these things out. There's so much splitting here. There's a lot of nearest neighbors. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have an ether and a ketone and not have it be an aldehyde, you start to wind up with a lot of carbons that have no nearest neighbors or only two nearest neighbors. So specifically, this is a CH3 that's a, that is a uh, triplet. And so is this, right? Which means you have to have at least two carbons on either side because you have to have a methyl with two nearest neighbors, which means a CH2 and a CH3 next to each other. Now, right there, that's four of our six carbons. 
So basically that allows us to rule out having a single methyl by itself on either side. Right, because if you've got these two, this one is not just a methyl group, it's a methyl group adjacent to a CH2. So that means basically we just have to decide which of these goes on which side. You're gonna have three carbons on one side of the ester and two carbons on the other. So that gets us down to here or oops, that's an oxygen. So I'm short a one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, oxygen, five, six. Those are our two choices. Now we're down to the point where splitting should be able to help us decide. Splitting here in particular, that's a CH2, right? And it's a CH2 that's got one, two, three, four, five, six. So five nearest neighbors. So that that's this one. And that one. But then we have our most deshielded is going to be the carbon that's directly attached to an oxygen, right? And we'll look at the splitting. There's four. So the most deshielded carbon has three nearest neighbors. So which of these does it have to be? This carbon right here has three nearest neighbors, integral of two, directly attached to an oxygen, so the most deshielded. Because if it was the top one, it would only be a triplet because it would just have the two. If it was the top one, our most deshielded carbon would be a triplet, not a quartet. Right, so it's a, a little bit of guesswork of that last piece, especially without having the more detailed NMR table. But we should be able to, when you, like, like we did here, we got down to a manageable number of possible isomers using the IR, using the formula, using the splitting. And then we can use the chemical shift to kind of decide these are either of these, like if you got the wrong one of these, that's a nine out of 10. For this problem. If I gave you this question on the test, here's the IR, here's the formula, here's the NMR, and you got down to these two and then you guessed wrong, nine out of 10. You were right there. And you got all the way down, especially if you get down to these two, if you say, and I know it's one of these two, and this is my best guess, that's probably a nine and a half out of 10 to show that you're like, I'm not quite sure, but I'm pretty sure it's this one. And here's my other option. I can give you even that extra half a point on that one, right? Because there will be some, sometimes it feels like there's, maybe there's something that you're missing. Maybe you missed that, um, that the splitting on this one, but you still got down to this point and then you couldn't decide. You're still down to one of two out of how many possible isomers are there for that formula? Whole bunch, right? All right, we're gonna end there and we're gonna do more practice with elimination and, and substitution on Thursday. Um, and then that's most of the material for this class. We've gotten through NMR, we've done substitution and elimination. We'll talk about how they overlap and how to decide between them, what the major mechanism is gonna be. But then that's all we're covering for this class. So we've got, and this is, week, which is good because this is week 10, right? We only have, two more lectures in a review. Um, so, but we've been making good time, especially with me missing two, two lectures already this quarter. So, um, so let's go to, we'll go to lab. We'll finish up last week's lab. Mariela's getting some dry ice and we're gonna do the CO2 extraction as well for the lemon.
And then we actually got that other solvent that I wanted to try out as well. Um, so we'll give that a try with um, the MTDE um, for one of our liquid, liquid extractions. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. 